The Joyful Friar podcast is made possible by the generous support of our friends. To support the podcast, please visit nathan-castle.com and donate today. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, your host. Today we'll be beginning a new trilogy. I'll be telling a story from my most recent book, the one right there over my shoulder, Afterlife Interrupted, book three, Please Let Me Explain. This one is chapter nine in that book. It's called Rita and Afterlife Rehab. It happened on um, August 21st of 2020 that the story came in a dream. And then really only a short time later, a couple of months later, uh, I was able to get with prayer partners, Michael and Linda Quinn, to uh, go into prayer and find out how we could help. But here's the dream as I received it and wrote it in my dream journal. I was with an elderly couple and their adult daughter. The daughter had a history of addiction and had stolen from them in the past. She had been through previous rehab stays. They were fed up with her. It was in the days before Christmas. There were wrapped gifts. The parents were washing their hands of any future responsibility for their daughter. They were about to drive her somewhere. She had a Christmas gift in her hands, and I awoke. Well, I remember this when all the way back to first receiving that dream, and then, of course, writing about it later. It was a a scene that had a melancholy in it. I could feel the way that the, uh, the woman in the story was telling it, that it was joy and sadness combined. It was, there was Christmas presents, but there wasn't joy to the world. As things unfolded, we learned that her name is Rita with an H. Originally, it was R-I-T-A, and at some point she added an H just to give it a little more panache and separate her from every other Rita anyone might meet. Turns out she, she was probably in San Francisco. That Maybe not. It was, That wasn't pinned down precisely, but it was. it could have been. And I've, I've uh, lived in the Bay Area a number of times, and it seemed like it, it was San Francisco. Perhaps not. Anyway, there were Victorian buildings and urban apartments, and older urban apartment buildings. She explained to us that she was uh, probably in her early 40s, and she had been struggling with addiction for a long time by then. She had been in residential rehabs, largely on her parents' money, uh, three times, and they had just not, not never really worked. As you heard in the dream, she had also stolen from them at least once. And what she was showing us in a dream was not her death. Her death came several months after that little sad Christmas party. But she just thought that that particular story was emblematic of her circumstance. She was had been able to keep a job, although she said that was always a little fraught because there were too many absences and you know other people having to cover for her. Uh, but she what she had been employed, but her parents decided that the the larger family gathering for Christmas would be different this year, and they explained to her that we just want to have a Christmas without your addictions. You're welcome to come to our home for a pre-Christmas dinner and a a simple gift exchange, and then we'll drive you home. So she didn't like the phrase tough love, but she said that's what it was, and they had every right. They were setting firmer boundaries with me because I had transgressed them too often. So that's what she showed us. She did say that after that evening, she did kind of go inward with the sadness and um, well, she said something like boo hoo hoo. It's, you know, nobody loves me, something like that. It wasn't very long before she spiraled downward for what turned out to be one last fatal time. She said, I didn't 
decide to take my life. I didn't inject myself with enough to kill me. She just, she said, I just took a street drug that of course was unregulated. It stopped my heart and that was the end of me. So that's a sad story. The thing that I'm grateful for in the ministry I've been given and I share with you in books and this podcast is that these stories do have a cosmic happy ending and we'll get into that. Rita explained that upon her death, she did land in a place that was essentially an afterlife rehab. She didn't go into a graphic detail showing us how she died. She didn't think that was really important to our work. But she explained that she was in a circumstance that felt familiar because it felt like a rehab. She said, there were safety structures all around me and people looking up after me to see that uh, I didn't harm myself in any way. She said, they gave me things to do that were part of a healing protocol. And she said, unlike the other times I had been in rehab, these worked. She said, there's lots of truth here and everybody trying to help me knew exactly what to do. I simply had to do it. Her guardian, Earl, uh, said she has a great aptitude for receiving a truth, hearing a truth and knowing that it's true. That's pretty special for people that have been in addiction for a long time because one of the aspects of addiction can be uh, deception uh, and denial. But for a person who'd struggled with addiction, she was pretty good at receiving truth, we're told. She told us that... Um, Earl, her guardian, stayed with her and that whenever she in her afterlife would begin telling a story that distorted the truth in some way, Earl, her guardian, would say something like, Rita, that's the way you perceived it. Here is, is how it actually occurred, remember? She said that her guardian was never uh, a jerk, never a uh, putting her down by correcting her, that she knew that Earl loved her and that any time Earl spoke to her or about her, it was with love. But Earl had a, a disarming way of just saying things like, Rita, that's how you uh, experienced it, but that's this is how it really occurred. She said, after he would do that, all I could say was, oh, So she was receiving some truths in her afterlife rehab. And she said that one of the things that she appreciated about this time around was that nothing cost anything. She said she had always been in rehabs where somebody really was healed and they left rehab because they were healed. And there'd be some celebration of that. And she said that and I would be left behind. She said there were times when I left rehab, but it really wasn't because I was healed. It was because the money ran out or the insurance wouldn't pay anymore. And so they would all try to put the best face on it that they could and say, look at all the progress you've made. But she knew deep down that her leaving rehab was not um, because of success. It was because of a shortage of money. She said, here, that goes away. There's your... There's uh, all kind of help, but it's not at anyone's expense. You don't have to feel guilty that you're, you know, running through somebody else's money because of your addiction. Well, when it, this was not a really long conversation, and she told us that it wouldn't be, but near the end, when it's time for us to help a person move to a next level or crossover, however you want to think of it, uh, she said she had been prepared, told ahead of time that one of the things that we, my prayer partners and I frequently do is ask them, can they think of someone who they know loves them, who has died, and who they'd be happy to see if that person were able to come welcome them or uh, help them make a move. She said, in my case, that there that was a no-brainer because when she was six years old, her seven-year-old sister, Brenda, had been killed in an automobile bicycle accident. 
So she said it, that it would be my sister was uh, a no-brainer if she were available. She went on to tell us that um, that part of coming to truth for her was being brought into a life review of her whole life. And she said it was entertaining because it felt like watching a movie of your own life. You know, I'm a member of IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and a lot of persons who have an NDE explain that a part of it was what's called a life review, where that, that soul who's out of body for a time is shown scenes of their life as though in a movie that had a particularly lasting impact on someone. Very often those scenes were positive impacts where some word of encouragement or some positive thing that you might have done for somebody that you'd long ago forgotten or maybe never even remembered uh, was came back to you and was told that, look at what you did because of your presence, somebody's life got much better. Conversely, there would sometimes be scenes where you might have not even realized that a, a joking word or some kind of sarcastic comment that seemed funny in the moment was really cutting and had a, a, a harmful effect on someone that kind of cascaded through their life uh, and created more darkness. So she said, even when that, when the effect that you had on someone's life was negative, again, it wasn't to shame or to rub your nose in it. It was just to point out uh, what an important impact we can have on one another and bring a person to greater self-knowledge. Part of the self-knowledge that was so important for her was being brought back into her life all the way back to early childhood to see where the propensity towards addiction even came from in the first place. She did learn that she had some genetic, you know, biomarkers that were, uh, that predisposed her toward addiction. Um, and then she, she compared it to a weed that might, um, it reminded me of a dandelion that might send out spores. And from this event, something would set out and started something over here or something over there. And she said, before long, there's this web of connectedness that, lead, that led, in her case, into deep addiction that eventually uh, ruined her life. But she said, one of the things that might have been um, plain as the nose on your face that was not at all plain to her was her sister's death, accidental death, when Rita was only six years old. She said it changed our household completely. She said her parents were in deep grief. And she said at the time that people weren't very skilled at discussing their difficult emotions. She said they just kind of picked up and did the best they could. She said she was always housed and warm and fed, but she said inside the house, her parents were emotionally unavailable in their grief and that she felt quietly inside herself as a six-year-old that she was now on her own to raise herself, at least emotionally. And that that uh, created uh, patterns that later uh, contributed to the pain of addiction. Anyway, she said, I don't know why we didn't see that. I didn't see that earlier. But anyway, she said, uh, all I'm really here for today is, is for you people to help me make a move. And you've asked me who I would like to go with or who might come for me. And it would definitely be Brenda. She mentioned that Brenda and she, at, at the time of, that they were little girls, always wore dresses and they were told about ladylike postures and so on and that she she thinks that Brenda was already calculating that one of these days she's going to be her own person and do things her way apparently after her death as Brenda moved along and and matured uh she decided that sh she had a wild side that she wanted to uh show her sister Rita so when it came time for her to to come and get Rita and, and move her along she came on an off-road vehicle, not a bicycle, an off-road vehicle, an all-terrain vehicle. And, she, and Rita said something like, it was one of those things where you would roar around uh, in a wilderness and kick up dust. And of course, she wasn't in a dress on that. 
but she she welcomed Rita onto her all terrain vehicle, and that was the way that Rita moved from place to place. But she was doing it, and she they were even told if you two wanted to go back and be your seven and six year old selves and somehow move through that experience of growing up together without a, a fatal traffic accident interrupting your childhoods, you could do that if you want. We you could show you how to do that. On the other hand, it looked like. Um, at least what the part that we saw that Brenda was not at all inclined to do that. And she was just wanted to take her sister on a wild ride. <laughs> so that's all it was. That's just the basic story. Uh, in a trilogy like this, I tell the basic story in uh, part one. Next week, I'll go into what we call compassionate response. Some of that is the way that people have heard this story since it was made public have responded to it. And uh, compassion means to suffer with. So sometimes we listen to a story through our own story, and it evokes something in us that makes us responsive to that story. That's what we'll do next time. And then the third part of the trilogy is what we call spiritual practice. Uh, I will make some comments about this story and ways in which it touches practices from my Catholic Christian tradition or other ways of um, moving through life uh, that might that might be helpful that somehow Rita's story um, brings up. So that's it for this time. So um, this was the first part of the trilogy, just telling the story of Rita and afterlife rehab. For now, uh, we're done, but I want to remind you that if you want to be in touch with me, just find me through my website, nathan-castle.com. There's a little contact form that you can uh, fill out to send an email. I try to be responsive to them if I can. I only ask that if you haven't read any of my books, please le read at least the first of the Afterlife Interrupted books before asking me questions about what I do. Uh, and then after you've done that and you're a little better educated about it, then I'd be happy to be in a conversation or an email exchange with you. But for now, remember, I'm always praying for you uh, and I hold you in my heart. So that's it for now. God bless you. Thanks for being with me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. God bless.